organizers for the invitation. Uh, so I was uh, supposed to have a joint talk with uh, Marc uh, Arnaudon, but uh, it's finally it's only me. So I will be talking about information geometry and shape analysis for radar signal processing. Um, so this is so this is work from my PhD and uh, the, the main goal of, of this work was to use shape analysis to improve the statistical processing of radar signals. Um, so the idea is that since a locally stationary radar signal can be represented by a curve in a manifold using information geometry, how can we perform statistics on these curves, on these manifold value curves, and so on the, on the signals that they represent? So first I will uh, say a few words about uh, this motivation this in, in radar signal processing. Then I will just focus on uh, shape analysis on, on curves in a manifold. And uh, I don't know if I will have time to uh, show some simulations and then maybe uh, an example of application to radar signal processing. Okay, this is weird. Okay, I don't know what happened. I have to go back to the <laughs> beginning of my, so it might take a while. <laughs> Okay, so spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> but you can just put S kind of like move, uh, uh, I mean. Is there a button to go back? You can quit full screen and, and move here. The... Yeah. So, or maybe uh, this should be, okay. Okay, so sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so we've heard a lot of things about information geometry. So briefly, the idea is to consider a family of probability distributions. Uh, uh, parameterized by a certain parameter theta, uh, and each uh, each density can be represented by its parameter in the parameter space. Um, for example, Gaussian distributions can be represented in the upper half plane uh, by uh, points uh, of coordinates mean and uh, standard deviation. Um, so, sorry, I'm not very okay. Uh, so, if we want to if we want to, uh, to be able to compare two uh, probability densities in this parameter space, we need a metric structure. And so the Euclidean metric is not a good choice in general, and this can be easily seen by considering uh, these four uh, Gaussians, A, B, C, D. A and C have the same mean mu1, B and D have the same mean mu2, uh, and the common standard deviation of C and D is larger than the common standard deviation of uh, A and B. And so in the space of parameters, uh, we have these four points. And so we want to, to intuitively, we want to say that C and D are closer to each other than A and B. And so we would like this to be reflected in the, by the distance. So we would like to say that the distance between A and B is greater than the distance between C and D in the parameter space. And this is obviously not uh, verified by the Euclidean metric. So instead, we use the Fisher metric on the space of parameters. Uh, so it, it gives us a Riemannian structure on the on the space of parameters. Uh, the tensor is given by the tensor of the metric is given by the Fisher information, and so it's chosen because it has a statistical in, uh, meaning. It measures the quantity of information contained in the data if we are doing parametric estimation. It's uh, it limits the precision with which you can estimate your parameter. Uh, this is a Cramer-Rao bound, so but this is um, something that you probably know. Uh, so once you have a Fisher metric on the statist on the, on your parameter space, uh, you get what you call the, a statistical manifold. And so uh, what's very interesting is that uh, in the case of univariate Gaussian distributions, uh, the Fisher geometry simply amounts to hyperbolic geometry. So this means that uh, the space of parameters uh, mu sigma equipped with the Fisher metric is in bijection with the hyperbolic upper half plane. Uh, just with this change of variables. So the, the statistical manifold in this case is just the hyperbolic upper half plane. 
So now, how, how, what does this have to do with uh, radar signal processing? So let's just consider the uh, radar setting. You have a radar looking in a fixed direction and sending uh, a burst of end pulses. Uh, so, of course, uh, so you're interested in what's the, the composition of an element of space in front of your radar. And uh, of course, each pulse will be, if there's a, a, an object, it will be reflected and you will receive an echo. So if you send n pulses, you get n echoes uh, for an element of space. And you have a vector of n observations, complex observations. Um, now, let's see what happens if we, if we do the, the, the usual assumption that we do in radar. That is that the, this vector of observation is the realization of a stationary st centered Gaussian vector. So uh, then this Gaussian vector, since it's, it's centered, so mean is zero, is entirely described by its covariance matrix. So its covariance matrix is, of course, Hermitian positive definite. Uh, but since we made the assumption that the, the Gaussian vector is also stationary, then it has an additional structure, uh, which is the, the toplet structure. So it means that on each diagonal, you have uh, constant, uh, constant elements. So this is linked to the, the stationarity. So in this case, our space of parameters would simply be uh, the space of Hermitian positive definite and toplitz matrices. Now, um, I talked about the Fisher metric because it's very well used, but in fact here we will not exactly use the Fisher metric. We will use another metric that is defined uh, using the Hessian of the entropy. Uh, and it turns out that this metric coincides with the Fisher metric on the space of Hermitian positive definite matrices, but not quite on the space that we look at where we have a topless structure on top. Now, why are we using this metric? Well, because in another coordinate system, which is uh, given by the reflection coefficients, uh, this metric takes a very nice form. So it turns out that we have a bijection between this, uh, the, the covariance metrics and these reflection coefficients, which live in uh, a product space. So here you have a, a real number, positive, and here n minus uh, one coefficients that live in the unit, unit uh, complex disk. So uh, these are associated to, to autoregressive models that ma maximize the entropy under the correlation constraints given by the, the covariance matrix. But what's important is that these coefficients also represents the second order statistics of, of our signal. And instead of uh, estimating the covariance matrix using the, the observations, we can estimate these coefficients, these uh, reflection coefficients. And why, why do we, are we interested in these coefficients? Because in this space of parameter, the metric, the entropic metric becomes a product metric, which is very convenient. So, we have these two uh, equivalent parameter spaces, uh, the space of, uh, matri of toplitz matrices, and what, we, what uh, Frédéric Barbaresco, uh, he, he, who showed, uh, who showed uh, that, that this metric was, uh, was, uh, uh, was a product metric in, in this space, uh, called the point carré polydisc, so, which means that we have uh, this uh, uh, R plus star equipped with this metric, and uh, the, the, the unit disc becomes the point carré disc. So, uh, so we, we can represent one uh, stationary signal, the, an observation of a stationary signal, uh, by a, a point in, the, in this point carré polydisc. Now, um, we are interested here, so for, for now we have our manifold, the point carré polydisc, but we don't have curves. So why are we interested in curves? Because um, this assumption of stationarity that is usually done in radar is not always relevant. And so we wanted to construct a model where we could uh, make the assumption that we have only local stationarity. So now if our vector of observation is considered as a locally stationary signal, uh, locally stationary centered Gaussian vector, then uh, the idea is that we can decompose it in, uh, in we decompose it in stationary portions. And so for each stationary portion, we estimate uh, a set of coefficients, so a point in the Poincaré polydisc. And uh, we obtain a time series or a discrete curve in the Poincaré polydisc. So this was the initial motivation of, uh, of uh, looking at uh, curves in, in a manifold. So, this, so the idea is that we want to perform statistics on locally stationary radar signals. 
uh, for example, do classification to, for target, target recognition or statistical tests for target detection. And so we want to do that by exploiting the shapes of the curves that represent them in this manifold, the Poincaré polydisc. So now I'll, I'll put aside a little bit the, the, the radar aspect and just focus, which that was the main part of my PhD, was to focus on uh, the study of, uh, of uh, shapes in, in manifolds. So, um, of course, uh, Alain and Xavier said already a lot of stuff, so that's nice for me. I don't have to spend too much time on the beginning, but so that a shape is a curve that it's uh, intuitively that is rid of its parametrization. Well, that is the approach that I will, that I will take. As uh, Alain said, there are many different approaches. So to compare two shapes, of course, we need a notion of distance. Uh, and, but to do statistics, a Riemannian structure is more convenient, as, uh, as Xavier uh, uh, suggested. Yes? Yeah, but if you come back a little bit. Yes? It's, it, um, it's not very easy to have a physical explanation of these components, but uh, they, they fully represent uh, the second order statistics of, of your signal. Okay. And there's a bijection between the covariance matrix and, and these coefficients. Okay. So it's an equivalent. Uh, uh, this Sorry. Like coordinates in the radar space, it's not time. It's not that like the, the end has no relation with time. Um, so well, time is going in, in no, it's not. A, well, it's a, it depends on the length of, of your of your vector. So uh, it depends on how many observations you have. So it's sort of yeah. Uh, so uh, you you ha if you have um, if you have a stationary uh, uh, vector uh, with n components, then you will get uh, n coefficients. So. Because you would you you would try to you would estimate uh, n times n matrix or uh, n coefficients in the in the. Oh yeah, yeah, but this means that this, this is a random vector that evolves in time and attains a stationarity and still has like a, just something described by the covariance matrix. But it's just to clarify in which sense this is low. I mean, this is, this is it, local. This is a no, shortage Z e is a vector. Yeah, uh, well, no, 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 this is, uh, so, it's just, if, if, if your vector, you consider it as stationary, you get, you get, uh, co you get these coefficients, uh, and coefficients, and if you, it's locally stationary, then you have to estimate, uh, your, your coefficients will change in time. If the station, if it's locally stationary, then the coefficients will, will change in time. So you get a, uh, so it, then it will depend. Like you have a sliding window. Yeah, you have, this, you have this gliding window here, and for each position of the gliding window, you estimate new coefficients because you, 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 you suppose that you assume that the stationary, that it's locally stationary, so your coefficients will, will change in, in time. Yeah, what's the meaning, the interpretation of taking a window? It means that, uh, that you assume that on this window, you're, you're, you, you select a stationary portion. It's just to refine. Uh, well, well, you have to you have to make an assumption. I mean, it's uh, it, it's e it's not easy to to choose which size of window you need to change to to choose. Maybe you should even make it uh, the size of the window should probably change. But uh, for now, we assume it's a constant size window, and and then. It, it's to it's it's when it's when you you it's to refine. It's not perfect, but it's maybe better in certain cases than to assume that it's completely stationary. Okay. So um, back to uh, shapes on, on manifolds. So uh, so as as, we, as I was saying, to perform statistics, a Riemannian structure is more convenient. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the space of curves itself is seen as a manifold, an infinite dimensional manifold, but a manifold nonetheless. And it's equipped with a Riemannian metric. So here I just schematically represented the infinite dimensional manifold of curves. Uh, this an element is, is, so an element of this space is a curve. And I, 
I represented it, the curve uh, just, just here. So uh, why is it interesting to have this Riemannian point of view? Well, because if you have two elements of your space of curves, and you consider the geodesic that comes from one curve to the other, then it gives you a notion of optimal deformation from one curve to the other. And this is very useful in applications. Another, uh, another uh, practical thing is that uh, the Riemannian point of view allows us to locally linearize around a curve uh, by uh, placing ourselves in the tangent space and to apply uh, many, uh, uh, to apply uh, geodesic methods to do statistics, such as geodesic principal component anal analysis and, and such. All right, so now a few notations. So uh, um, cursive M will represent the space of uh, the set of parametrized curves in a Riemannian manifold, okay? Uh, and we consider curves that, with velocity that never vanishes, so immersions. So um, the tangent vectors to this uh, infinite dimensional manifold are simply uh, infinitesimal deformations of our curves. So uh, there are infinitesimal vector fields along the curves that we consider. Okay, so um, we also need the notion of reparametrization, right? Because we, want, we are interested in the shapes. So we consider that the curve can be reparametrized by composition with an increasing deformorphism of zero one. Zero one is the, is the, the, the parameter of, of the curve lives in zero one in the segments. So we have open curves. Um, now, to be, just to, to, to avoid confusion, I will always denote by T the, the time parameter of curves and by S the time parameter of, the, of paths of curves, right, to avoid confusion. And uh, I will use subscripts to, to denote uh, derivatives. So, uh, we have our infinite dimensional curve manifold uh, and we want to equip it with a Riemannian metric uh, that I denote by G and, and this defines a uh, a scalar product locally defines a scalar product on each tangent space. Uh, and of course, this will give us a distance, uh, the geodesic distance. Um, so how, can we, how do we choose this metric? Uh, as uh, Xavier said, uh, there are, uh, or Alain, uh, there are a lot of different choices, but the main requirement is that this metric should be reparametrization invariant. So that means that it should verify this equivariance property. Now, if this is true, then the distance between two curves does not change if we reparametrize them the same way, all right? Um, but we have to be careful that it does change uh, if we reparametrize them in different ways. So if here we have phi and a different psi, then the distance changes. So I'll just anticipate a little bit on the rest of the talk um, and, uh, and show simulations that use a, a metric that I will present later. So here I, I show Two curves here, there's a segment and a certain sinusoid, um, parametrized in a certain way. The parametrization is given by the way that the points are distributed along the curves. And here I show the optimal deformation from one to the other, the geodesic for, for my metric, the metric that I will present. And from the first image to the second image, I have reparametrized the two curves in the same way, meaning that it goes fa we go faster at the beginning and then slower. And from the, from the first curve to the third curve, I, haven't, I have pa reparametrized the first curve in a certain way and the target curve in a different way. So we can see that when we reparametrize the, the curves in the same way, both curves in the same way, the deformation does not change. And so the distance is practically the same. But if, if it is not the case, then we, we observe that the distance does change. So. So uh, how do we so how do we pa go past that? Well, we 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 uh, consider the Cauchy space. So uh, so this was already uh, uh, described a little bit. So we consider sh the shape space to be the the Cauchy space of the, sp the space of curves quotiented by the space of uh, the set of reparametrizations. So uh, so the, the a shape is the equivalence class of all the curves that are identical modular reparametrization. And we get a principal bundle structure um, from the space of curves onto the shape space, although uh, to have a real principal bundle structure, we have to get rid of free Im immersions, but I won't get into that now. So uh, the fibers are, are just uh, all the curves that project on the same shape. 
Uh, and so we can uh, decompose uh, the tangent space into a vertical subspace and a horizontal subspace. What does this mean? That means that any, uh, ob any infinitesimal deformation of a curve has a vertical part that we, ha with, that we have for effect just to reparameterize the curve without changing the shape, and a horizontal part that will change the shape. Um, okay, so um, if the, the metric that I choose, which is uh, if the metric G that we put on the top space is reparameterization invariance, then it induces uh, a metric on the, on the shape space uh, for which the geodesics are the projections of the horizontal geodesics of the top space. So we are able to, to, to induce uh, a metric on the, on the bottom space. And the induced distance on the bottom space is, is the following. So to compute the distance betwe between uh, the shape of C0 and the shape of C1, we need to find uh, the optimal reparameterization of, of C1. We can fix C0, and we, we need to find the optimal reparameterization of C1 uh, uh, with respect to C0. And this is, this is given by the endpoint of the horizontal geodesic. Okay, so um, there are many choices for G. Uh, I still haven't chosen the metric. There are many choices, and uh, as was already mentioned, the L2 metric is, is, uh, is not uh, the right metric to work with because it induces uh, a zero metric on the shape space, as was shown by Peter Mischer and David Mumford in 2006. So this is the, the L2 metric. Here we just have to, to, to make the, the, the metric reparameterization invariant, we need to have the, the norm of the speed here but uh, it writes more compactly this way. So the L2 metric is, uh, is not possible. So um, we, we can add derivatives to obtain the Sobolev type metrics. For example, this one. This is an ex just an example. Um, and uh, another class of metrics that was proposed are elastic metrics, where we put different weights in front of the tangential and the normal components of uh, our derivatives. So the, the, the tangential component is the component that is uh, tangent to the curve, and uh, the normal component is the residual component. So we obtain a two-parameter family of metrics uh, with coefficients a and b. So a will give you the degree of bending of the curve, and b the degree of, of stretching. So that was proposed by uh, Mio, Srivastava, and Joshi in 2006. Now, what's interesting with this is that for a certain choice of parameters, namely a equals one and b equals one half, always, this is for plane curves, uh, we, uh, we have a flat metric, right? So this metric is flat. What does this mean? So it means it can be obtained as the, as the, the pullback of the L2 metric using a certain transformation. This transformation is called the square root velocity function. It was introduced by Srivastav and its collaborators in 2011. Um, and the, the square root velocity representation of the curve is just its speed renormalized by the square root of its norm. So there's a square root because, um, so that you, you get a, a reparameterization invariant metric. But yeah, so basically the speed renormalized. And so with this distance, to compute the, the, the distance between two curves C0 and C1, you simply need to compute the distance between their uh, renormalized uh, speeds. And this is very convenient because most of these metrics have very complicated formulas. I mean, it's very hard to compute the geodesic equations. And, and so, so having a flat metric is very convenient for the, for the computation. So this, is, um, this was uh, extended to, to different settings, uh, to any, any elastic metric or to curves in a Lie group. Uh, recently to homogeneous spaces. And uh, the work of uh, this work was to extend this, uh, this uh, framework to curves in the manifold. All right, so now let's consider our, our, curves, uh, our, our curves on the Riemannian manifold. And the, the metric that we propose is exactly analogous, except for we have covariant derivatives instead of derivatives because we're in the, in the manifold. But it's the same analogous metric. Um, and we were able to show that it has a, co well, it has a compact form in, in, in the square root velocity coordinates. It's not, no longer a flat metric, unfortunately. But um, the, the main idea is that we, we get this metric that has two, uh, two parts. A first part here that will uh, measure the difference of positions between the curves. 
And this integral part here will measure the difference between the velocities of the curves. And, and this, this uh, form will, uh, will be very helpful to compute the geodesic equations and, and what we need to construct geodesics and do statistics. All right, so we can compute the square norm of, of, a, of the speed of a path of curves. Um, and uh, we are looking for the geodesics, which are the length minimizing paths and the critical points of the, of the energy. So we were able to, to, to show that the, the shortest path, the geodesics for this metric, verify this partial dif these partial differential equations, where the terms here, depends on the curvature tensor of the base manifold, the, the manifold in which the, the curves lie, the sphere or the plane or the hyperbolic space or any other manifold. So um, this equation here, this first equation, will, will describe how the origin of the first curve is transported to the origin of the second curve, whereas the, this equation for all t will, will describe the rest of the, of the deformation. So, the, the, the first thing to check is to see if this is a, a generalization of the flat of the flat case, right? So uh, what happens in the what what happens in the flat case where uh, this term here depends on the curvature tensor, so it vanishes in the flat case, and so this is zero, and this is zero, and we we just obtain uh, these two equations, which means that here. Uh, the acceleration of this, uh, this is zero, so, so we, we cover a straight line between the origins, and the acceleration here is also zero, which means that we do have an L2 geodesic between the square root velocity representations of our curve, so we recover the, the flat case. All right, um, maybe I'll skip the proof. It was not very important. So. Uh, now that we have the, the geodesic equations, uh, we can we can um, we can tr tr construct the geodesics uh, by solving them. So here I, I'm, I'm anticipating also the rest because I need a discrete model before to before implementing. But never mind. So here um, uh, the first step, sorry, the first step is to build the exponential map. So the exponential map will tell you how to optimally deform a curve in a certain direction. So here uh, I have a discrete curve, right, because uh, this is, a, this is a, an implementation. So I have a discrete curve and the direction is given by this vector field, this discrete vector field W. Um, and the, so the idea is that we numerically solve the geodesic equation, and so we can propagate. Uh, so how do we propagate? We propagate the position by uh, following the infinitesimally following the, the current velocity, and we update the velocity using, uh, using the acceleration. And this is given by the, the geodesic equations. So we stop at time one, and we obtain the optimal deformation of C in the direction of W. This was a simulation in the hyperbolic half plane. So now what is more useful in application is to solve the boundary value problem. So to give an, an initial curve and a target curve, uh, how do we compute the optimal deformation from one to the other? So this can be done using what we call geodesic shooting. So uh, if we want to use the exponential map to do this, we would need to know the, 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 the direction that will send the first curve onto the second curve, but we do not have it. So this is what geodesic shooting, uh, this is the purpose of geodesic shooting. So we initialize the, the, direc the shooting direction in a certain way. We compute, we measure the gap between the curves, and so we, when I say shoot, I, I mean by, with the exponential map. We measure the gap between the, the curve that we obtain and the curve that we want. So this is done using the, the pointwise distance because uh, we, we don't know how to do better. So uh, we measure this gap and we, uh, we, we assume that this gap is the endpoint of a, of a Jacobi field and we, estimate the initial speed of this corresponding J Jacobi field. It just means that we want to take the information back to the origin. And this information will help us to correct the shooting direction. And we iterate, so we shoot again in this new shooting direction, and we see that we get closer to uh, the, tar the, the target curve. 
and we finally converge. So this is uh, this this so this converges in this in the simple case. There are obviously some cases where it doesn't converge when the curves are too far away from each other. Or but in the cases that uh, I've looked at, it behaves pretty well. Right, so uh, now we can compute a mean uh, using a, a Karcher flow, which was uh, already uh, presented. So uh, this is an example of a Karcher flow be between uh, three uh, curves. So I have three curves, and I initialize the, the mean curve. I compute the geodesics using geodesic shooting. I compute the geodesics that link this mean curve to all the curves I want to average. I, I deduce the initial speeds of these geodesics, I, I sum, and this is the direction in which the, the mean curve has to, be, uh, has to be moved. And we converge to the, to, to, to the mean curve. All right, so, um, but what we wanted, uh, so now what I have shown is optimal deformations between parameterized curves. I haven't, uh, I haven't used uh, the quotient space yet. So, now, uh, what we want is to have a Riemannian structure on the space of unparametrized curves. We want to compute horizontal geodesics to obtain uh, deformations between shapes. Right, so we remember that uh, the geodesics uh, in uh, between two shapes uh, are the projections of the horizontal geodesics of the, of the top space. And so if we, if we want to, we can fix a parametrization of the first one and look for the optimal reparametrization of the second one. Uh, and this is given by the horizontal geodes geodesic, right? So, um, so sorry, this, this is what we call optimal matching. Optimal matching. We, ha we, fix, we have two parameterized curves. We fix the parameterization of the first one, and we want to, to, to find the optimal reparameterization of the second one. So why, why is that important? So uh, maybe this uh, can help, see, uh, help explain the motivation. So here I show uh, several curves which have the same shape but different parameterizations. Now, if you, the, the, the different parameterizations again are shown by the, the way the points are distributed because there are discrete curves. So if you do the pointwise mean, then you will get uh, a mean curve that, uh, that, has, that doesn't have the right shape, right? So it would be interesting to redistribute the points on the different curves before, uh, before doing a, a mean, right? So, um, so what we proposed is uh, an optimal matching algorithm to, to find, to find these, this optimal reparametrization of, of the target curve, right? So we, um, we, we propose to decompose any path of curves into a horizontal part composed with the path of uh, deformorphisms, right? So um, it's easy to see that the horizontal part of a path of curves will always be at most as long as the path itself. So we will minimize, by, by computing the, the horizontal part, we will, we will reduce uh, the, the distance between the fibers. But if we have here, if we have C0 and C1, we compute the geodesic and then we compute the, its horizontal part, we will have a shorter path, but it won't be a geodesic anymore. So what we want is we want a geodesic that is also horizontal. So to do that, we, we propose this simple algorithm where, um, so we compute the geodesic between our, our two parameterized curves. Then we compute the horizontal part. This gives us a new, uh, the, the end point of this horizontal part uh, will give us a new representative for our target curve. And then we, we, we compute the geodesic between the, the C0 and this new representative. And then we iterate the horizontal part and the geodesic, et cetera. And this should converge to the horizontal geodesic that we are looking for and give us here the optimal, um, the optimal reparametrization of the target curve. All right, so what is, uh, what is this horizontal part and how can we compute it, right? So um, the first step was to, to characterize vertical uh, and horizontal vectors. Okay, so it's no need to go into the details, but uh, we were able to, to show that, uh, to characterize the decomposition of any tangent vector into a vertical part and a horizontal part. Uh, using, the, we, we found this, uh, this equation anyway. Um, so 
this, this led us to characterizing the horizontal part of a path. Okay? So, uh, so the, hori the horizontal part of a path is the path of curves itself. And it's in each time s, it's, it's composed with this path of uh, diffeomorphisms phi, which is a solution of this partial differential equation. Okay, I'm not going to go too much into the details. I'm just going to show a, a simulation. Maybe it will be more interesting. Um, so here, uh, these are four simulations of optimal matchings between, uh, between two segments. So in this case, uh, in each case, we have different sets of parametrization of our two segments. So the first step is to compute the, the geodesic between uh, our two parametrized curves. The second step is to compute the horizontal part of these uh, geodesics. This has for effect to redistribute the points on the target curve. And then we iterate and we see that we converge on, uh, on this deformation. So these horizontal lines are the, the path taken by each point when, de when they deform. Okay, so we can do the same thing here. Uh, we're, we're, we have the same parametrization for the, the initial curve, but not for the target curve. And we see that we converge to the same, to the same horizontal path, right? Uh, in this case, the, the parametrization of the first curve is not the same as in the two first, uh, two first examples. But we see that the overall shape of the deformation stays the same in each case. So in red, always the horizontal, and in blue, the, the geodesic. So, so here, there are several examples. Every time in, in, in each, there are eight examples. In blue, there is the geodesic between the parametrized curves. And in red, it's the, the horizontal uh, paths uh, given by the optimal matching algorithm. And we can see that here, uh, if, we, if we don't, before we, we apply the optimal matching algorithm, we get different uh, shapes of deformations. Here it's, uh, it's like this, whereas here it's more like this. So, but whereas in red, they all have the same sort of shape. And if we, if we put them on top of each other, we see that they overlap uh, perfect, oh, well, very, very well. Whereas here, the, the initial geodesics don't overlap very well. well that's the, they have different shapes. So what we obtain here is truly a geodesic between the two shapes, the shapes of our two segments. Um, we can see also that the, we, we can, this is reflected also in the lengths. The length, this is the length of the initial geodesics, and these are the lengths of the, of the horizontal geodesics. And so this common uh, value gives us the distance between the shapes. Right, and so this is the result that we get uh, computing a, a Karcher mean after, uh, after optimal matching. Okay, um, maybe a few words on, on a discrete model, right? So um, in practice, we often have series of points instead of continuous curves. Uh, and so instead of considering this uh, infinite dimensional manifold, we can consider the finite dimensional manifold, which is just the product, uh, this product manifold here. M is the base manifold and N plus one if you have N plus one points. Um, what we, uh, we assumed here for the discrete model that the base manifold has constant sectional curvature um, to, to have uh, simpler equations. So, and we, we particularly derived equations for three settings that, are, uh, that we found interesting. Uh, so uh, the sphere, the plane, and the hyperbolic uh, half plane. Um, so obviously there are a lot of applications for all these settings. So, So uh, we consider discrete discrete curves, so series a series of points, discrete tangent vectors, and we um, we we introduced a, a discrete metric, which is uh, the discrete analog of the of the metric that we had proposed in the continuous case. And instead of of discretizing the equations that we already had and implementing them, we rederived all the equations in this discrete Riemannian setting, right? So. Um, we can make precise the notion of discretization uh, in a very natural way. So um, saying that a set of uh, n plus one points is the discretization of a continuous curve if the continuous curves go through these points at regular times. 
And we were able to show the convergence of uh, the discrete model toward the, the continuous model, convergence of the energy. So again, not too many details, but just uh, that the difference between the energy of a, uh, a path of discrete curves and the energy of the limits path of curves, of continued curves, is, uh, is bounded by uh, a constant over n, and this term here, which uh, so depends on the regularity of the path of curves. But if the derivatives are in a compact, then you can, we can have a constant over n. So this, uh, this gives us a, a convergence result of the discrete model to the continuous model. Right, so uh, we derived uh, discrete geodesic equations for this metric and this Riemannian, discrete Riemannian structure. And uh, we, this allowed us to implement uh, the exponential map, which I have already shown you, the geodesic shooting algorithm, the optimal matching algorithm. And, uh, and yeah, this is what uh, I used to, to, for the simulations that I have already shown. Uh, so a few simulations here. This is uh, optimal deformations from one curve to another in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, in blue for R metric, in green for the L2 metric for just to uh, have comparison. We can see that R metric has a tendency to, to shrink the curve when it deforms most of the time. Uh, we could do it for the plane also, of course, and the sphere. And uh, this, this is example, these are examples of optimal deformations between the shapes, not, not the parametrized curves, for plane curves. So again, here I, I did it for several parametrizations. Uh, I overlapped them, the, the parametrization, the, I overlapped the geodesics in blue uh, between parametrized curves and in red between, uh, the, I overlapped the horizontal geodesics and we can see that once again, uh, the horizontal geodesics uh, overlap very well and give us uh, really the, the optimal deformations between the shapes. All right, so um, I don't know if I have time to, to conclude. Ten, oh. oh, okay, good. <laughs> All right, so um, we unfortunately didn't have time to go very far in the, in the radar applications, but um, we were able to, 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 to take an example. Uh, the, the idea here is to, is to compute uh, the mean signature of, of a helicopter. Right, so we have um, our data, or what is our data? Our data are m vectors of radar observations obtained using, uh, that we obtain using a simulator. And each of, of, the, of these uh, vectors uh, corresponds to the observation of a certain uh, helicopter in, in an element of space. And, um, for, for, and for each different vector, we have a slightly different, uh, it's the same object, but we have a slightly different ro rotation speed of the blades. And this can happen um, in real life, the same helicopter depending uh, on which is the angle at which we see it, uh, if it's man doing a maneuver or something, there, there can be slight uh, variations of, of this rotation, and this will impact the signal that we get and the signature that we will observe. So the idea is to create a mean signature that takes into account the, these variations. So for each of, of these uh, vectors of observation, we, uh, we estimate um, the, the curves in the Poincaré disk, the evolution of the, of the reflection coefficients. Um, here, the number of coefficients is linked to the size of the stationary portion that we choose. Of course, it's, uh, it's arbitrary and, well, it has to be adjusted. Um, and so it's the size of the, glide, uh, it's the, size of the gliding window. And uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, these curves in the Poincaré polydisc. And since the Poincaré polydisc is a product manifold, okay, we, have, we have a curve for each coefficient. But since it's a product uh, metric, we can pairwise compare the coefficients, the, the curves uh, corresponding to each coefficient. So we can compare uh, the, the first coefficient of one vector to the first co coefficient of the other vector, and this, for the second, the same, etc. Right, so what we have in the end are curves in the, in the Poincaré disk. Right, so... Um, so here I just show examples, uh, in the, it's in the hyperbolic half plane, but it doesn't matter. Uh, 
So uh, here the different colors of curves represent uh, uh, the, the evolution of the second co reflection coefficient of, um, of each vector. So each color corresponds to a, a certain uh, ve uh, velocity of the, of the blades, rotation uh, speed of the blades. And so we had only several points. So here they are linked by uh, segments, but this is not, uh, it has no meaning. It's just for the, for the representation. So, and in black is the, is the mean curve. And I, I did it for several examples. So there is not many comments I can do on that. Just that uh, I was, it's possible to compute these evolution of reflection coefficients. We can compute the mean curve because, because of the tools that I have shown. But what, is, uh, what, has to be, what has to be done is um, if we want to use the, all this uh, complex model on, of uh, tools uh, between shapes, we need to, uh, to, to do it with optimal matching. Here I have just computed mean curves without doing optimal matching. So, because, so I haven't had the time to do this yet. But, so the next step would be to interpolate between the points, right? Uh, so uh, this would uh, require to use splines on the manifold. Uh, this would truly give us the mean signature, the mean, uh, sig the mean shape of, uh, of, the, of, the, of uh, the signals, uh, helicopter signals. Right. Um, okay, so uh, many other things to do uh, in this aspect. We, we, need, we would be, it would be interesting to compare the results obtained uh, uh, with this local stationarity hypothesis to uh, what we would obtain just using the stationary, stationarity hypothesis. We know that we suspect that there are some, uh, uh, some cases where it, it is interesting, but we haven't had the time yet to, to compare the results and see in which cases it, it's very interesting. Um, of course, uh, testing different metrics would also be, would also be uh, interesting. And more generally, now that we have this Riemannian structure that allows us to uh, compute distances between, between curves, compute mean curves, mean shapes, uh, now what would be interesting is to, to do statistics, to maybe uh, uh, classification, geodesic, principal component analysis, and, and such methods. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Questions? It was so clear. <laughs> okay. So, what about computational aspects? Um, okay, so uh, the this method is actually very gen so the, the the method I propose is very general, so that's the plus side. The minus side is that uh, the computation is quite long. So if you if you if you are looking at curves on the sphere or the hyperbolic space, you probably you have other methods that exploit the the, stru the simple structures of these spaces that can be computation computationally more effective. So. Uh, on a computational point of view, it's uh, it's not the best way to do it. But the, the equations that I that I use can are very general. They they can uh, be used for any manifold. But yeah, they're a little slow. <laughs> so so I want to understand. So why do you need to compute the mean helicopter? So if you want to distinguish between a helicopter and a civil uh, airplane, yes. I guess you would also need to know what's the variance of the helicopter, not just the mean, right? Yes, uh, well, it, that, th this particular example was to uh, maybe create a, a, me a, template, a template. So if you have a lot of data observing this kind of helicopter, you could have a lot of signatures, and the goal would be, how do I compute the mean of all these signatures that I have to, to make a, a reference signature so that when I'm looking at uh, something, I, I think maybe this is a, this kind of helicopter, I can compare it to this mean, uh, this template uh, mm -hmm. uh, signal. 
right? But but of course, then um, these kinds of method would would be would yeah would we can say uh, what is the distance between the signal that we observe and the signal of a plane, and if it's significantly different, then maybe it's not a plane. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I I wonder if you can choose the distance so that your projection is a Riemannian submersion. Because in this case, then uh, there is a theorem that tells you that if you choose the initial uh, tangent of the geodesic, which is horizontal, it will remain horizontal all the time. Th that's the case. That's the case. It's, so, uh, so it's already the case. But the, the yeah. thing is, if uh, you don't know where you where you you will land, you you can start horizontal. But if you want to, you want to land on a, in a particular in a particular place, right? Other questions? So I think the just one last one. I assume that people are not very interested by radar, so uh, I could give some other example. If you are interested by Google uh, Google project, uh, they have developed uh, uh, 60 gigahertz radar for their uh, Google Watch. So the idea is to use a Doppler signature of gesture for uh, gesture recognition. So the, the, the Doppler modulation are no longer uh, generated by the blade of the helicopters, but by, the, by your finger. So you, you will define different uh, gestures. It will generate a time frequency signal, a time Doppler signal, and they will use uh, learning uh, techniques to recognize the different gestures. So, uh, in the domain of learning, uh, time frequency uh, signal is uh, is uh, emerging in many uh, in many applications. Not only for for radar, but also it could be also a problem of uh, uh, audio 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 signal processing. Also.